Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the IAS. Welcome to Thursdays at 4. I'm going to make a couple of announcements before we get into the really fun part, which is our speaker today. So for those of you who are not regular attendees at Thursdays at 4 or, or Institute for Advanced Study events, there's a sign-up sheet on the side table against that wall. And there are also some flyers for future programs that might be of interest. Um, the main thing we want to remind you all is that next Thursdays at 4, which will be right here in this very room, we're celebrating 10 years of the Institute for Advanced Study, a collaborative celebration with a panel of former fellows, collaborators, and IES board members, and uh, thinking about sort of how we move into the future, and we're going to ask you to help us think about that. So please come this Thursday at 4, bring your friends, bring your children, whatever. Uh, we're happy to have everybody. Okay, our, our speaker today, I'm very happy uh, to introduce and is probably known to many of you. Um, Bruce Braun is a professor in the Department of Geography, Society, Environment and Society, and he's also an affiliate associate faculty member in, Americans, in the Department of American Studies. He did his PhD in geography at the University of British Columbia, and what's really most important is that he is a former IAS fellow. Yeah. Um, some people in the university might think it's more important to be a McKnight land grant professor, which in <laughs> fact, or professorship, which in fact he has held, but we think it's being an IAS fellow. <laughs> uh, he is also the author or editor of five books, most recently, Political Matter, Technoscience, Democracy, and Public Life, Environment, Critical Essays, and Human Geography. I'm, I'm not listing his co-editors here, but uh, so apologies if any of them are in the room. Uh, the in and, and then a, mo and a monograph, The Intemperate Rainforest, Nature, Culture, and Power on Canada's West Coast. Uh, most recently, he wrote an introduction to a special issue, Futures, Imagining Socio-Ecological Transformation for the Annals of the Association of American Geography. And, um, and uh, his other recent work has addressed topics like the Anthropocene, neoliberalism, biopolitics, and issues of governance in an era of climate change. Uh, and in keeping with uh, thinking about next week, thinking about uh, our recent announcement of the Grand Challenges, he's also been teaching a Grand, Challenge, uh, uh, Grand Challenges course on the fracking boom, promises and challenges of the hydrocarbon re re uh, renaissance. renaissance. And uh, so without further ado, I'll get rid of my slideshow and introduce Bruce Bronze. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jennifer, for the kind introduction and the invitation to talk today. Um, and uh, thank you to the IAS staff. They've run this Thursday at 4 series now for many years, and it's uh, become a really important part of our intellectual life here at the University of Minnesota, and I appreciate all the work that you guys have been doing. And thanks to the rest of you for showing up on a busy Thursday afternoon uh, to hear a talk about a place that we usually don't think of as a particularly glamorous destination, North Dakota. Um, but if uh, a recent issue of The Economist is to believe, North Dakota today stands at the very center of current economic um, and geopolitical events, um, with the effects of its boom and its bust rippling through the U.S. economy and rippling through U.S. relations with Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and so on. 
the rapid expansion of oil production followed by the spectacular collapse of oil prices, upending oil, and oil markets and capital markets globally. So there's a way in which North Dakota has suddenly found itself sort of thrown into the center rather than the periphery or a peripheral site that is very much uh, uh, tied in to sort of global, global change, uh, ecologically global change too. So since 2008, basically when this oil boom started, North Dakota has been very, very much in the news. So the talk I'm going to give today is taken from a larger project, and the larger project is one that orders, uh, that explores what I call the orderings of social and political life in and around sites of resource extraction. That is, the kind of attachments, desires, struggles, and solidarities that emerge within and alongside the knowledges, technologies, property regimes, and unpredictable flows of capital and labor that mix together at these dynamic, politically charged sites. So I'm interested in North Dakota, then, as a site where oil and speculation mix with labor and the land, where extraction occurs within, stirs up, and at times deepens the social and the political relations of settler colonialism, where, what, where men and women struggle to produce a life amid the conditions of what the anthropologist Elizabeth Pavanelli has called late liberalism, with its forms of inclusion and exclusion, recognition and abandonment, protection and vulnerability. The story of the boom and the forms of life that it has engendered is too large for one talk. So this afternoon I want to focus on one aspect of the boom that until recently has received very little attention, and that's the problem of workplace fatalities. As we'll shortly see, the oil fields in North Dakota have seen worker fatality rates an order of magnitude higher than oil fields anywhere else in the United States. Most of those who have died have been migrant workers, drawn to North Dakota by the promise of jobs and high wages. Thus, for the most part, their deaths have been experienced and endured by families and loved ones who live far from the oil fields in Ohio and New York, Louisiana, or Mexico, but whose deaths have been largely ignored in the local and national media. It's only recently, in the past year and a half or so, that journalists have begun to pick up the story, uh, with Al Jazeera first breaking uh, the story uh, a little over a year ago, and others like Todd Melby in his superb Black Gold Boom series, which you can see online, and more recently, the political satirist John Oliver on HBO, taking up this story uh, in the past few months. Now, many journalistic accounts have employed the language of exceptionality when discussing these death rates. That is, they've insisted that there's something out of the ordinary happening in North Dakota. A kind of astonished, oh my god, look at that mentality that at one and the same time renders these deaths visible, but spectacularizes them in doing so. So over the course of the talk, I'm going to develop an argument that these death rates are best understood first by attending to how tight oil, I'll explain that in a minute, becomes something I'm going to call fast oil. That is, the ways in which oil field workers are continuously faced with the pressure to speed up production. But towards the end of the talk, I'm going to also propose that it's both analytically and politically necessary to counter this language of exceptionality used by people like John Oliver and to recognize instead the intensely ordinary nature of these oil field deaths. As what cultural critic Lauren Berlant has described or describes as, quote, the amplification of something already in the works. What I mean by this, the amplification of something already in the works will hopefully become clear as the talk proceeds. So this is one part of my story today, and perhaps the greater part of it. But to give this account, we will have to grapple with something else. The role that geology plays in our story. Not simply as the substratum upon which orderings of social life occur, or as raw material that, at, that we might mine or extract 
in order to produce our lives, but as an insistent materiality that adds something of its own to our story. For as I hope to make clear, while the issue of worker fatalities in North Dakota is very much a political economic matter and needs to be analyzed as such, it is also a deeply geological one in which the subterranean, with its diverse properties and unique dynamics, is a constitutive part of the phenomena that we study on the surface. Where if we remove the geological from the story, we lose something of our capacity to make sense of it. So for those of you who follow these sorts of academic debates, I'm also interested in the ways that political economy might engage with and respond to what some have called the geological turn in the social sciences and the humanities. Now, my topic, dying on the job, is not a happy one. And I have worried at points about that it perhaps wasn't appropriate for a public lecture such as this one. On my desk at home, I have reports that detail dozens of deaths in the North Dakota oil fields. These reports are not easy reading. Nor is it always clear what it means, ethically and politically, to find meaning in other people's deaths or what stories one tells to honor the lives of workers killed on the job. I have at times been unsettled myself by this project. If at times this talk seems too dark, we may want to uh, keep in mind another story about the boom. And this other story is that of the remarkable ability of migrant workers to persist despite their precarity who endures in ways that keep possibilities open and alive. I'll come back to these questions uh, over the course of my talk. I think there's one chair. Here. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, let me begin by taking you to North Dakota uh, and setting the stage a little bit. Although it's widely referred to in the media reports as the North Dakota oil boom, the oil boom in the Northern Plains has uh, not strictly been a North Dakota phenomenon. The boom actually began in eastern Montana in 2006, and with the center of exploration and production only shifting to more <coughs> productive fields in North Dakota around 2008. It also includes, as you can see, parts of Manitoba and Saskatchewan, uh, although the development north of the Canadian border is less intensive than south of the border. And at times, the boom is sometimes referred to as the Bakken boom. And that's named, uh, that's after the oil-bearing shale formation that's buried almost two miles underground in parts of the Williston Basin. What started as a few drilling rigs in 2006 rapidly grew to around 90 by 2008, falling back sharply during the financial crisis and then really taking off in the summer of 2009, such that by 2011, there are up to 200 rigs at any time active in the North Dakota oil fields, drilling thousands of wells each year. The result was a dramatic increase in oil production, shown here in the shaded dark blue area of the graph. And you can see it reaches about 1.2 million barrels a day by the summer of 2014. The light blue line in this graph, on the other hand, shows the rig count, which as you can see fell dramatically in late 2014 when oil prices began to fall. Since 2014, production levels, as you can see, have been relatively stable, but for reasons that I will outline shortly, they are likely to start falling in the next few months. Perhaps the most storied aspect of the boom has been the massive migration of workers to the oil fields, <coughs> mostly men, starting in around 2009 and continuing until the present. That the boom took off in 2009 was in no small part tied to the availability of large numbers of unemployed or underemployed workers, many deep in debt or facing foreclosure, desperate for the high paying jobs rumored to be available in the region. The migration of workers reversed a decades-long trend of population decline, but also triggered great anxiety about the changing ethnic and racial composition of local communities, 
about overwhelmed services and infrastructures, as well as concerns about so-called man camps and informal settlements, and warnings about the dark side of the boom, its hyper-masculinity, bar fights, and uh, rising crime rates, and more frequently than anything else, its strip clubs, moral corruption, and morally corrupt women, and the very, uh, very real problem of sex trafficking, all of which provided endless fodder for news stories across the country. These headlines were collected by a research assistant, Jesse Lehman, uh, but it gives you a sense of sort of the way that the media picked up on what was going on. The same troops were, re were repeated in documentary films, the same tropes were repeated in documentary films, and even a miniseries on ABC, all of which depicted the boom as a rough and tumble frontier in which the migrant male worker was viewed as a problem that needed to be managed and policed. But what this pathologization of migrant workers occluded or faced was something else. The very same men who apparently needed to be policed were also dying and being injured at an astonishing rate. In 2012, workplace fatality rates in North Dakota were more than five times the national average. And this is data that's been collected by the AFL-CIO from state um, state records from each state uh, across the country. Indeed, the fatality rate was 45% higher in 2012 than the next highest state, Wyoming. <laughs> this was almost entirely due to the, to the oil boom. Um, the year immediately before the boom started, the fatality rate in North Dakota was 7 per 100,000 workers. High, but not unusually high for an agricultural state. Equally as shocking, but also hidden from view, was the drastic increase in the deaths of male Latino workers who had migrated to Williston in search of work. Fatality rates for all workers in North Dakota increased 250% in the five years before 2012, but the fatality rate for Latino workers increased 400% in the same period. Lest we imagine that it was a one-year phenomena, these are the numbers for 2013. Slightly lower, but not significantly. And the 2014 data should be out um, fairly soon. To put this in a better perspective, we need to look at statistics for the oil and gas sector in particular. And I'll also include the construction sector here because it also went, had the same kind of um, a spike in, in workplace deaths. What is notable is not just how much higher the fatality rate in, this, in these sectors are in North Dakota than the overall state rate, but how much higher the fatality rate in these sectors is compared to the national average for the very same sector. In other words, the high fatality rates in North Dakota are not simply about the dominance of the oil and gas sector in the last five years. What must be noted is the uniquely dangerous nature of this sector in North Dakota in particular, <laughs> where fatality rates are almost seven times higher than the oil and gas sector nationally, and where the discrepancy in the construction sector, construction sector is, is almost an unbelievable ten times higher. Again, the 2013 numbers tell much the same story, although the construction sector improves significantly. So, we have um, high fatality rates compared to other states, as it shows on the left, but especially high in the oil and gas sector okay, compared to the national average. So this is data of workplace fatalities. It came as something of a shock to learn that we have no reliable data on workplace injuries in the North Dakota oil fields. North Dakota does not systematically track workplace injuries or it does not do so very well. The AFL, AF, AFL CIO simply doesn't collect that data from North Dakota because it doesn't trust it in terms of its reliability. Um, uh, but in interviews, uh, even if it did collect this data, it's not entirely clear how much it would capture about oil injuries in the oil and gas uh, sector. Uh, and this is true because, as, as we learned in interviews, there's all kinds of incentive not to report injuries amongst oil and gas workers. And we'll see why that's the case in a minute. We do know, however, that there were about 3,500 burn injuries in the five years at the height of the boom, <coughs> five years. That's more than one a day 
with the nearest burn unit a thousand kilometers away in Minneapolis. So how are we to make sense of this? What meaning do we give to these deaths? One answer, promoted by the oil and gas industry itself, is that the industry is an inherently dangerous one. We have oil rigs, we have lots of moving parts, we have flammable substances, material under high pressure, lots of trucks, and so on. Okay? This isn't untrue, but it simply accepts these high injury and death rates as part of doing business. And further, it can't explain why these fatality rates are so high in North Dakota in particular. A second answer has recently been offered in a National Academies report. This answer suggests that the high death rate is due to what they describe as a demographic transition in the oil field workforce. And the argument here is that an aging workforce in the industry is being replaced by a younger generation of less experienced workers, and further, that there are not enough experienced workers to mentor them. So in the words of the report, quote, there's a big crew change underway. Now again, there's some truth to this. Oil field work is very much a learn-on-the-job occupation. There are no training manuals. But I find this explanation unsatisfactory. First, like the previous explanation, it can't explain why death and injury rates are so much higher in North Dakota than elsewhere. And secondly, it assumes that responsibility for workplace safety rests with workers, not employers. The problem isn't seen as inadequate training or a lack of workplace safety regulations and enforcements, but rather inadequate worker-to-worker -worker mentoring. In short, the worker comes to be defined in terms of a kind of lack. What this report and others fail to do is ask what I think is the more important question, and that is, how is it that such high-risk environments are being produced in the first place? Now, here we're going to need to take what it might at first seem like a bit of a detour. Most accounts of the boom tell the story in terms of the technological innovations that enabled it, in particular the development of hydrological fracturing. This is because the oil produced in North Dakota is what is known as tight oil. The oil is called tight oil because it's trapped in highly impermeable rock and is thus very difficult to extract by conventional means. It's uh, one of the reasons why it's also grouped in with a, with, uh, a series of oil resources that are known as unconventional oil. Conventional oil and gas reserves have a very simple structure. Usually there's a source rock that contains the original organic material from which the oil and gas is formed, a reservoir rock above it and into which the oil migrates, <coughs> that rock is usually sandstone, and then finally an impermeable seal that blocks the oil from migrating any further. In essence, the oil is trapped under an impervious seal, often under considerable <laughs> pressure. <coughs> Conventional oil is a relatively easy to access and relatively inexpensive to extract. One simply drills down into the reservoir, and the pressure of trapped oil is often sufficient to bring it to the surface. Because the rock is permeable, the oil and gas will continue to migrate towards the borehole. With tight oil, the story is very different. Here, the source rock, the reservoir rock, and the seal are one and the same. In other words, oil is formed in low porosity, impermeable rock, and is essentially trapped there. The Bakken shale is such a formation, and this has much to do with how it was formed. Its formation dates from approximately 400 million years ago, when what is now North Dakota was much closer to the equator and covered by shallow seas. These seas had a high LJ content, which, when it died, mixed together with fine silts on the sea bottom, and over millions of years of compression under other sediments, formed mud rock, or shale. As this rock heated, the organic material, in a sense, cooked to become oil and gas. Merely drilling into this rock isn't sufficient to draw out the oil. 
This is because the pores of the rock are too small. There's no way for the oil to move. If you can get really technical for a moment, it has to do with pores that are so small that the surface friction between water and oil in the pores is enough to hold everything in place. With larger pores, the natural buoyancy of oil brings it to the surface, unless trapped by a seal. In tight oil formations, everything is quite literally locked in place. Nothing's moving, and most important, drilling into it doesn't change the situation. Something has to be done to enable the oil to move. And this something, as we all know, is hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. Just going to jump ahead here. There's a long history of fracking, which I'm going to jump over. Um, but today, after years of trial and error, oil companies have settled on basically a multi-stage process in which explosives are used first to create small cracks in the rock, then highly pressurized fracturing fluid filled with propens is pumped down the well and into the cracks, extending and widening them. And then when the water is removed, these propens remain behind, propping the cracks open, allowing the oil to move. Hydraulic fracturing, however, was not enough to make the Bakken play profitable. Two other important innovations were also necessary. The first, horizontal drilling, which dramatically expanded the area that could be uh, exploited by a single well. And second, and perhaps the most important innovation in terms of the Bakken play, the ability to isolate sections of the borehole when fracking the well, thus vastly increasing the water pressure and creating much larger and longer fractures. Now, a lot of attention has been paid to the potential environmental effects of fracking, concerns about induced seismicity, groundwater contamination, and so on. I'm going to leave that aside for today. <laughs> what is less commonly known about fracking is that oil production from a fracked, tight oil well looks very different than oil production from conventional wells. In conventional wells, flow rates decline at a rate of 2 to 5% annually. In other words, they have a long life and are relatively productive over that long life. Fracked shale oil wells have a completely different profile. Their flow rates decline by up to 70% by the end of the first year. In other words, when you frack a well, it all comes out at once. And after that, very little additional oil will migrate to the fracture, through the fractured rock. Everything beyond or to the side of the fractures remains locked in place. The result is an initial burst of production followed by a rapid decline. Steep decline curves mean that you need to drill more and more wells just to keep production levels flat. Some of the industry have called this a drilling treadmill. The very nature of the reservoir and the technology used to access the oil uh, including a large um, fixed asset cost to this, to this technology, has an inbuilt imperative to drill more and more wells just to keep production levels constant. This is true of North Dakota as a whole. This is a graph that projects future production, uh, uh, total production, from all the new wells being brought online, each colored strip representing the new wells drilled in a specific month. If drilling stops, production falls off very quickly. So from the perspective of the North Dakota state budget, now increasingly tied to royalties and production taxes, the state too has an interest in sustaining production levels. Now, this geotechnical matter intersects with a second issue. Virtually all activity in the North Dakota oil patch is debt financed. Here we need to know something more about the structure and the geography of the oil industry in North Dakota. Oil companies in the region are generally what are known as independent oil companies, in contrast to the large international oil companies like Exxon, BP, and so on. While they have what are called property positions in the Bakken, that is, they have oil leases, they are only able to develop these leases by raising money on financial markets or through bank loans. Much of this is short-term debt, 
especially so <coughs> for smaller operators who have far more difficulty accessing venture capital or issuing bonds. Further, there are only a very few sweet spots in the Bakken where the cost of production falls below, say, $40 a barrel. Production cost in much of the Bakken is much higher, often above $60 per barrel. And often small companies have to take a significantly higher differential on WTI, that's the West Texas Intermediate, the, the pricing of oil, because they don't have access to infrastructure by which to move it. That is, they have to sell their oil at a discount, effectively decreasing the wellhead price uh, that they're able, to, that they're able to, to, to get. During the height of the boom then, companies were borrowing vast amounts to mo of money to drill in areas that were sometimes quite marginal, unless prices were high. To avoid default on loans, they had to maintain cash flow. To do this, they couldn't simply rely on existing wells because production drops off far too quickly. And the further into marginal sites the drilling moves, the more companies had to find ways to reduce the cost of production. But the story is actually more complex than this. In North Dakota, oil companies own rights to the oil, but they do not do the work of exploration and production. All of this is contracted out. Indeed, there are usually no com oil company employees whatsoever at drill sites or well sites in North Dakota. Instead, what's known as a company man oversees and coordinates the well site from drilling all, all the way through to completion. Now, despite the name, the company man is not an employee of the oil company, but instead an independent contractor, or more often an employee of an independent contractor that coordinates all the other independent contractors. So this is a key point. Every stage of oil production in North Dakota is contracted out. Drilling companies, fracking companies, service companies, top to bottom. Like the oil companies, most of these contractors are also relatively small operators and almost all are also highly leveraged. So you have contract, subcontracting top to bottom and highly leveraged from top to bottom. Subcontractors, in turn, are equally interested in speeding up and maintaining and speeding up production. As mentioned, they are also debt financed, but perhaps more important, the next contract depends upon performance in the current contract. There's intense competition between these highly leveraged drilling and well service companies to get the next job. It comes down to a simple thing. How fast can you work? Or how fast can you drill? This results in some perverse incentives. To give an example that has received a great deal of media attention in the last year, uh, Oasis Petroleum, a drilling company, pays, uh, was, was found to have been paying bonuses to employees after Ill each drill site was completed. And they paid a safety bonus of $40 per day and a performance, basically a speed bonus, of $150 a day. It's not hard to imagine the calculation. One aims for the performance bonus and hopes to collect the safety bonus along the way. Finally, workers themselves participate in this culture of speed. Part of what attracted tens of thousands of workers to North Dakota were reports of salaries of $100,000 uh, $100, a year annually and above. If you're in debt or you're facing foreclosure, this is pretty attractive. But in reality, these jobs were hard to come by. Most jobs in the oil boom were not on the rigs or in the oil fields. They were trucking, service work, Walmart, and so on. And while it's true that Walmart paid $20 an hour in Williston at the height of the boom, this sounds good only until you realize that at the height of the boom, a one-bedroom apartment in Williston went for $2,500 per month, outpacing even Manhattan and San Francisco. With no job security on the rigs, virtually all employees or uh, subcontractors are, are uh, on what are known as at-will contracts. The culture of speed comes to be embodied in the day-to-day -day activities of the workers themselves. If you balk at a request, you lose your job. 
a point stressed to us by numerous workers. But more than this, for many workers, speed becomes a point of pride. And crews regularly post their well completion times on social media, sometimes including video of themselves at work. It's interesting to just Google these and watch some of these videos. The comment section to these videos is often very telling, as workers compete with each other over whose times are really the quickest, even as they react with astonishment at the risks that they are all taking. Indeed, one of the most interesting and disturbing aspects of our interviews with workers was how they understood their own worthiness in terms of the ability to work quickly. To be sure, this is part of the hyper-masculinity of the oil fields, but the important thing here is that workers come to identify with the very thing, speed, that places their lives most at risk. One sense of autonomy, that is, one sense of one's ability to feel in control of the situation, is achieved by embracing the very imperatives that are outside of your control. Working fast opens doors. We have identified a number of other factors that, in a sense, further amplify the dangers of fast oil. Uh, but I'm going to skip over these in uh, the interest of time, only to touch on the last one, uh, just uh, this, this thing, what I'm calling morning at a distance, uh, um, because I think that, that this is also an important thing to sort of keep in mind uh, with these oil field deaths. Um, and as I noted earlier, um, a, lot of these, a lot of the workers are, the vast majority of the workers are migrant workers. And, even if their deaths, when they die in the oil fields, they happen locally, they're not really felt locally. And this is something that's worth thinking about. Um, so while you have these very high fatality rates, the effect on local communities is somewhat muted, as is the response of those communities. Mourning happens elsewhere, far from the scene, out of sight. In the local communities in North Dakota, workers are a problem, there is very little concern with the problems of workers. Let me sum up. The National Academies, I think, are correct that employees tend to be young and inexperienced. And this explains in part the high death rates in the North Dakota oil fields. But I think this is too simple a story. The Bakken boom is talked about in terms of tight oil, but I think it's equally as important that we talk about it in terms of fast oil. I want to conclude my talk by returning to some of the larger conceptual and methodological questions I introduced at the beginning. First, as I hope I've shown, to understand how tight oil becomes fast oil, it's not enough to turn to political economy traditionally conceived. The geological formation matters, as do the particular technological arrangements at play. Here, I'm in agreement with scholars the likes of Catherine Yusuf and Nigel Clark and Myra Hurd and others who insist that we have to understand the, way, the ways in which social life is subtended by a material world that exceeds us and that cannot simply be bent to any and all human desires. To overlook geology, then, would be to miss a great deal of the story. But to say that life is geological, however, is not to fall into environmental determinism. Rather, what I hope I've also conveyed is that while social and political life is intimately tied to geological strata, to the energetics of the subterranean, how this is expressed in the, social, in the ordering of social and political life can make, take many different forms. It's an open question, a political one. The danger of the of the geological turn in the social sciences and the humanities, a turn that is coterminous with the nomination of the Anthropocene as a new geologic epoch, although not reducible to it, is that we risk naturalizing a particular social or geosocial formation. We literally ground it in the rock. The oil industry in North Dakota thrives on this story. The industry is inherently dangerous, we are told not because it produces high-risk environments, but because of the nature of the resource and the technologies required to extract it. Risk, and who is asked to bear it, 
is thus seen as a geological, not political, issue. It's essential, I think, that we see it as geological and political. We can't tell the story about the ordering and disordering of social and political life in North Dakota without close attention to the material qualities of shale oil, nor without attending to the technologies and techniques developed to extract it. The qualities and dynamics of the subterranean matter, but they can find expression in any number of social forms. What I hope I've also demonstrated is a methodological point, namely that what has come to be called new materialism, with its attention to the liveliness of the material world, including not just plants, but rocks and minerals, need not be opposed to historical materialism, with its emphasis on historically evolving modes of production. Rather, the former presents methodological challenges to the latter. What I have proposed and hopefully performed is a political economic analysis in which everything is a mediator rather than an intermediary. That is, following the French science studies scholar Bruno Latour, no element, whether geological, technological, or institutional, functions merely as a transparent relay. Each element changes the story. Each element introduces a swerve. Finally, Although the death rates are extraordinarily high in the oil fields of North Dakota, I think that it's crucial that we don't frame this situation as exceptional or extraordinary. To do so, I think, would rob these deaths of their potential meaning. And it's with this point that I want to draw this talk to a close. Yes, the death rates in North Dakota appear extraordinary, at least in terms of quantity or rate. But following Lauren Berlant, I want to propose that here, as elsewhere, quote, the extraordinary always turns out to be the amplification of something in the works, a labile boundary at best, not a slammed door departure. I want to insist on the ordinary nature of these deaths, not because the high fatality rates don't matter, but because they do. And they do not only because of the immense loss experienced by distant family and friends, but because I think they speak to a larger truth about the conjuncture in which many Americans today live, work, and die. The vast majority of the workers we talked to in North Dakota were there because the oil fields promised a way out of precarious lives elsewhere. Some have lost their businesses, others have lost jobs, Many had mortgages that were underwater and faced foreclosure. Still others were carrying heavy, heavy student debt loads. This is not true of all workers in the oil fields, but it was true of a great many. Giorgio Agamben has spoken of, of the shifting up of precarity into the petty bourgeoisie, a process that preceded the financial crisis of 2008 and the Great Recession that followed, but which the crisis and the recession lay bare. To return again to the language of Lauren Berlant, the shifting up of precarity had been in the works, at least since the 1970s, but hidden by the availability of credit, the housing bubble, cheap imported goods, and the subsidy provided to American workers by the hyper-exploitation of labor in the global south. In her book, Cruel Optimism, Berlant talks about precarity in terms of slow death, the slow attrition of bodies occurring at the meeting place of two dynamics, the speeding up of production and reproduction as traditional <coughs> infrastructures for reproducing life crumble, and alongside this, the responsabilization of the individual who must now be an entrepreneur of oneself. Or to put it slightly differently, the individual who must engage in the self-management of risk. Slow death for Berlant is the fate of the precariat, an expanding population who frantically grasp to stay in labor as such, a population seeking to negotiate the impasses of a present in which good life fantasies are framed but still exist. The death rates in the North Dakota oil fields are shocking. Indeed, they are scandalous. John Oliver is correct to say we should be angry. But far from understanding this through the exception, 
I propose that the oil fields lay bare truths about the moment in which we are living. A generalized precarity, although always different from case to case and from place to place. The struggle to find ways to carry on, to endure, to endure while being exposed. I don't feel comfortable welding this at all. Fast oil in North Dakota is singular insofar as it emerges at a unique conjuncture of capital, technology, and geology. Its effects are deadly and dramatic. But following Berlant, I think we are witness, what we are witness to in North Dakota is the amplification of something already in the works. In the encounter of precarity and fast oil, we may simply be witness to the extreme end of slow death, or perhaps peering into its inner truth. Thank you.